Oh, right. What's it? <laughs> oh, you told me what it's called, and I forgot what it's called. The noodle thing. Bansit. Bansit. Yes, right? It's good. This is the Settlers of Soul podcast. I'm your host, Arius Dare. This show's guest is Alexine Sanchez, a former embassy staffer at the South Korean Embassy in Manila and a KGSB scholar at Korea University. We talk about the impact of Hallyu in the Philippines, Philippine-South Korea relations, her thesis research, a really interesting look at the way the U.S. military entrenches itself in different communities in Korea, and, and much, much more. Before we jump in, just want to plug the new Settlers of Seoul Instagram feed, where we'll be posting quotes and comments from previous guests. You can find it at Settlers of Seoul, all one word. Also, we're now on YouTube. For those of you who prefer to stream audio on there, just search Settlers of Seoul. In that case, use three words. Okay, here's Alexine Sanchez. So one of the fastest growing segments of the international community here in Seoul and also more broadly Korea is the Filipino community. So, you know, I would like to hear your thoughts about, you know, what that community looks like, how that's growing and, and the future that the Filipino community plays um, in, let's say, making Korea more colorful. Uh, but before that, I would actually like to hear what your experiences were like growing up. I understand that you had a, a pretty typical uh, first exposure to Korean culture, but then that ended up manifesting into something uh, quite unique. So uh, let's start at the beginning. How did you first kind of get exposed to things, all things Korea? Back in 2000 or 2001, I was watching a lot of Chinese movies, Hong Kong movies. So that's, that was when I kind of warmed up with Asian, you know, media, music, movies. And then in like about two years after, one summer, I was just like sitting in my room watching TV. And then I saw Xinhua, like this K-pop group, group that was a very popular at that time. And it was, I think, their sixth album. And I was watching one of their performances. And from there, it hit off. I went on online forums, got together with Filipinos and other friends from other parts of the world and just like chatted with them online for about four or five years and then met up with them like in the Filipino community of, you know, K-pop listeners then. And then later on, 10 years after, I meet some of my friends, like my online friends from the U.S., when they came here to Korea while I was living here. So we would watch concerts together now and actually, you know, have that kind of community with with people I met because of K-pop or because of Asian music overall. Had how you really hit the Philippines yet? Was this something that was easily accessible? Was it popular? Had you, had you heard about it before and you just had not seen it? Or was this very niche at the time? I think the Philippines would have been an easier or a malleable market compared to other countries. Why is that? I think it's because of the Filipino Chinese community. Since we had these, uh, this community, they were already familiar with Chinese music, with Hong Kong movies, like the real ones, you know, like mainland um, media, like Chinese mainland media. And then you have K-pop, Korean media, and Hallyu doing the same thing and actually doing even better than at that time. We also have anime too. So I think that was um, one of the things that made K-pop flourish better in the Philippines. So it's more of like an Asian teamwork, I guess, cooperation. (laughs) Now I'm thinking about it. It's, I wouldn't say really invasion because I don't think Filipinos, like the general Filipinos think it's an invasion, but it's more of like embracing being Asian, you know, like, oh, we're Asian. We're not just like speaking English and always fantasizing anything American, but also like, say, Korean songs or say also know about anime, which is Japanese. So I, I would say a little bit, I would word it in a more positive way, embracing being Asian. So I, I understand that you actually really embraced the Asianness so much mm-hmm. and <laughs> so much so that you actually <laughs> took your, um, your fandom to uh, heights that few Filipinos had reached. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience? Yeah, I told you about the Philippine K-pop convention, right? And, um, I wouldn't say I was. A... What is the, the Filipino K-pop convention? Okay. So basically I started with a small fan club community of, um, Big Bang followers. So I really like Big Bang. And they, I followed them since they were like about to debut in 2006. This was an online community? 
Yes, it was an online community. And then we kind of like got together from Zoompi, I would say. Yeah, from Zoompi.com. So I don't know if a lot of people are actually familiar with it because Zoompi.com was an online community, was an online forum. I think that was made by a Korean American based in Los Angeles or in somewhere in California. We, they had a big bang thread there and I would post every day, would go on there every day and talk to people and then eventually find out there are Filipinos in there and then get together with them like offline, send them MSN messages, Yahoo Messenger, you know, messages. We decided to make an online forum called Big Bang Philippines. So I was one of the few people who started that community. I mean, my my very shallow understanding of K-pop fandom is it, it's, it's very, it, it's just that. It, it's very shallow. It's vapid. It, it, it's basically based on the aesthetics of how these K-pop stars look. Can you push against that? I mean, what did K-pop mean for you? What did it mean to be a Big Bang fan? Yeah, so for me, obviously, a lot of people thought at first, like, why would why are you listening to someone, you, so, to people you don't understand, right? That's the initial thing that people ask me when they find out I really like listening to Korean songs or Chinese songs. But because of the community that I tried, like, I was a part of because of this online community that kind of became, you know, friendships, um, communities that actually help the community, the bigger part of the community. It helped me actually have, say, organizational skills, you know, talk to people, be more sociable, how to actually, I wouldn't say properly talk to people, but to be to be social, to, to be pro to, proactively to be social? Kind of proactively social, yes. You know, like to how to approach a person. Because I was when you when you look at the timeline, I started helping them organize this Big Bang Philippines thing when I was 15, 16 years old. So that was a very young, I was underage when you think about it. So and we would, you know, call up events like uh, like places so can we like can we hold events here and stuff like that so you know you have that kind of organizational skills kind of meaningful experience I would say and obviously of course um I really had good friends from it so when you when you think about it the friends that I had from my k-pop days it's been 10 years now what you're saying, it sounds like, is that you actually learned a lot about yourself and a, and a lot of these useful yes. life skills and that K-pop just happened to be a vehicle through which you could, you know, hone in on those and, and learn about it and, and get better from. Right. Yeah. I read a bit about how the K-pop fandom has actually used their love of Big Bang and these, these other K-pop groups to actually improve the lives of those around them. Did you experience any of that in the Philippines? Um, yes, actually, we did. Um, we were kind of following whatever Korean fans were following, actually. Previously, we talked about, like, you asked me about the rice wreaths or something, right? Like fan rice. I think right, fan the, rice. The yeah. official name. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, the fan rice thing. We actually did that in the Philippines. So it's like a drive for rice, for for whatever, like a donation, like being donated to um, a non-government organization or something with a... Yeah, so just for those that aren't aren't aware, basically what you would do is you would with your fan group for EXO or Sistar or whatever whatever group you really like, what you would do is you would try to get rice, buckets and buckets of rice. Mm -hmm. And then the way that you showed how loyal or dedicated you were to this particular group would be represented by how many buckets of rice you had. So it kind of became a competition. Right. Kind of, yes. And um, like they would donate it on behalf of the K-pop group or a mm -hmm. K-pop star, something like that. So we had that thing in the Philippines too. So we, we did it with Big Bang Philippines, I think, for, for a time. Like we did an event. So we raised money for it and then like co contributed six cent money to Korea for the f like Korean fan clubs who like, oh, this is our portion. Like this is Big Bang Philippines portion. And they donated this much of rice to like the selected charity under Big Bang's name. We also mentioned about like we talked about the Philippine K-pop convention, right? So that's in affiliation with Gawad Kalinga in Paz. So Gawad Kalinga is a non-government organization in the Philippines. 
that is um, focusing on community building. So they what they do is like they try to go to communities like slum communities and build houses. So back then we would have actually events like a Saturday or two and actually have K-pop fans go there and build houses with GK. We I think some of the profits of the convention also goes to GK as like they're a regular partner now. Pause is like Philippine Animal Welfare Society. So I think they they also have some collaboration with that. I I wasn't in the Philippines I think at that time when they had that collaboration with Pause though. So it's actually quite a dynamic relationship that's kind of yes, like when you think about created it, here. Mm, yeah, when you think about it, it's more of it's kind of grand, <laughs> you know. Like I and a lot of people actually don't know about this when it comes to K-pop, especially in the K-pop community in the Philippines. And I've never, I don't really talk about this thing to people because obviously it's like K-pop. Like you went to Korea because of K-pop. That's like a little bit embarrassing, especially now I'm in grad school. So can you describe what the group dynamics? are like so let's say you're a big bang fan does that preclude you from also listening to exo albums does that actually direct your friendships um you know walk us through what it like means to be part of one of these organizations mm. i mean obviously you can't be just focused on big bang I, I listened to everybody else at that time when you listen to big bang you'd, you'd be inclined to being friends with those who listen more to, say, YG and more of, like, the hip-hop kind of... So describe to me these different... The, like to, like these are labels, mm -hmm. right? But, you know, walk me through what SM and, and YG and what, what these different labels mean. So you just said that YG is... Kind of since, like... Hip-hop. Hip-hop, yes. SM Entertainment is a little bit more pop. So you hear Super Junior, right? Girls' Generation, Dong Bang Shengi, TVXQ, EXO, I think. Yes, EXO. Um, and then you have JYP, which is like a little bit more sexy, but pop. So you have 2PM, right? We had Oktekyon in GSIS. Um, Miss A? Sister, I think? I don't know. Yeah, those JYP, I think, would a little bit be more sexy, but pop, like bubblegum pop to some extent. That's how I would categorize it. But obviously, everybody's friends in that community, in our community, in the Filipino K-pop community. So... Nobody actually prevents you from listening to whom if you're part of this particular organization. But then you'd have like that kind of, I wouldn't say stereotype, but just like a, an image like, oh, if you like Big Bang, then you must like other hip hop, Korean hip hop artists, right? If you like um, SM, if you like TVXQ, you probably be into pop more than hip hop. So that kind of delineation. So there's not exactly, and in, t in terms of, friendships there's no delineation or like boundaries i would say boundaries in in who you whom you can be friends with so we didn't have that kind of say click mm -hmm. you know it basically everyone's trying to be friends with one another because eventually in the k-pop convention the, the whole organization everybody needs to be friends with one another because you're working into like a big organization so they would have meetings with all of the heads of the fan clubs and actually work through a schedule and, you know, because you have to go what, through. What does the schedule of a fan club look like? Like, I'm going to post at 9 p.m. or... Like, <laughs> well, I mean, now that um, before it was like, it was more of, oh, we're going to have um, an event on this day. So, so your members could also attend in our event. Please don't make an event on this particular day. And most of the events would be on Sunday or Saturday. Um, yeah, Sunday or Saturday because most of the people then are students, are college students or high school students. So they are only allowed to go out of the house on weekends. So they say, oh, on the 15th, um, Saturday, we can't, um, like you can't do an event for say Big Bang because TVXQ fan club would have an event on that day. So please schedule it probably in the next week or maybe two weeks after. So people could save up for it. And actually go to the event and schedule that event for for their for them. So that's interesting. So it is it is kind of this this um, ecosystem that you've created, right? And this is all driven through Sumpi. It started from Sumpi, but then again, the Filipino K-pop community kind of became separated from that. But then a lot of people then, when Sumpi was still an online community until maybe 2010 ish, yes, 2009 2010 ish, a lot of Filipino K-pop listeners or 
fanatics are still going on Sumpi, but after that, I think they created their own safe communities and also went to other sources for K-pop news or K-pop news or say their gossips, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because I think after Sumpi became popular, there's also all K-pop. All K-pop was very popular, but I stopped following them because they started blasting news, like rumors and stuff that doesn't even... It's like a Perez Hilton type thing. Kind of, yeah. It's like a TMZ kind of thing, but it's K-pop. You know, mm -hmm. they tried to like have tips, like send us some tips of you go onto the website before. Like, oh, you can send us some tips and they'd make like a short article about it. So it became more of like a K-pop rumor site. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I didn't like that anymore and just like... But by that time, I was already cutting off from K-pop because I was, I finished college and I was already working at the Korean embassy. So I started kind of moving away from a lot of Korean because, uh, Korean stuff because it was stressing me out, you know, every day listening to say Korean people talking, I'm like, oh, they're asking me stuff to, for work. It's stressful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They, they found out that you worked at the Korean embassy. They want to know all the, the tips, right? They can. Submit to this this website. I wish I had a lot of tips about K-pop, but like K-pop stars. But I never met any, you know, I never met any Korean, like if any famous Korean while I was for, while I was working at the embassy. So I mean, well, I'd love to hear about your experience at the embassy. But I, I, I want to, you know, keep circling back to K-pop in the Philippines. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think that Koreans really like to emphasize how popular and well received their media is across the world. Um, of course, when they mean that, I think for most Koreans, they mean the, the white Western world. Um, however, that's really not the case, right? Me from the West Coast, I've mentioned in previous episodes of this podcast, mm -hmm. it's, in, it's an extremely niche market. Um, it, it's, it's very, very low on the level of awareness, slightly more in your bigger cities with your Asian American communities. But in, ter in terms of being a, a cultural force or having any type of impact, the Philippines, however, is one of those countries where it seems that Hollywood has really taken off and, and really could be described as a, as a wave, right, where the K-pop, K-drama popularity is driven into other things such as cosmetics or business ties and, and tourism and these others. So can you, I guess, describe, like, is that really the case in the Philippines? Is Korean culture really that popular? And if so, how does that manifest itself in daily life? I, I haven't lived in the Philippines for, say, three years now, right? But I th I would say it's getting into mainstream now. K-pop is getting into mainstream. So Spotify is quite popular in the Philippines. And, you know, you have playlists there. And I have a Spotify account. When I listen to a playlist in Spotify that's, say, top 50 or top 20 Philippines, you'd have Korean songs in there. That are actually playing in Korea. For, so this is top 20 for everybody. Yes. This is not just top 20 Korea billboard or no, whatever. No, this is top 50 or top 20 Philippines. From how I remember it, um, say I left the Philippines 2014. Mm -hmm. to, from 2013, 2012, I would listen to the radio and they would actually play Korean songs. Like say, Sorry, Sorry, Super Junior. A lot of people know it. So even the no, dance. You, you never get that in the U.S. It's never. Yeah. I wouldn't think you would get that. In I mean, US. Gangnam Style is like a complete outlier right. in that regard. Yeah, Gangnam Style, everybody knows it. Even grandfathers, probably grandmothers know it. And Super Junior, my like aunties know it, you know, that kind of saliency, that kind of visibility. And well, we also have a lot of Korean drama. So you know how primetime, the primetime is? Mm, the primetime in the Philippines, I think, is about 10 p.m. to 11 p.m. They actually have Korean dramas there. So the time when Filipinos... On the major networks. On the major networks. Like, so we have two major networks, three major networks. On the two major networks, ABS, CBN, and GMA network, they have Korean dramas playing from 10 p.m. to, say, 11 p.m. So that's when most Filipinos, say, watch, you know. So very visible, very visible to, like, all walks of life. And what about Korean cosmetics, Korean food? Well, Korean cosmetics, we have a tood house, we have skin food, we have Nature Republic, we have Tony Moly, I think. And, and so uh -huh. are the, the, the Filipino consumers then directly connecting those with Korea? Or yeah. is it just, oh, these are, these are good 
brands and I, I want this for my skin? Or are they saying, no, this is a Korean brand and I want to buy that? I think both because, you know, Korean skincare is actually pretty good. Like even, even I think Western, you know, makeup bloggers actually rave for Korean skincare, but um, Filipinos are both, oh, Korean skincare is good. Korean makeup is good. And at the same time, oh, it's Korean. It's like how, like what K-pop stars probably use. So let's try it and let's try to copy it because it looks pretty on them. So let's try to buy it since it's already here. And um, so I have a lot of friends who come to Korea, right? And a lot of them buy, you know, Korean cosmetics. And they'd be like, hey, Alex, can you buy me this and that? Because it's a little bit expensive in the Philippines. Can you tell me if it's if the difference of the price is actually you know, big. So if yes, can you please buy it for me there and send it to someone, you know, that kind of thing. It's very popular. I would say it reached to like Revlon or like, um, say L'Oreal level of, uh, cosmetics in, in, in that sense. Is there a large Korean expat community that lives in the Philippines? I think yes. So according to the statistics, uh, don't quote me on this, but I think there'd be about 90,000 to 100 um, Koreans living in the Philippines. I mean, this is not just in Manila. Koreans are scattered all over the Philippines. So we have like major cities like Manila, Baguio, um, Cebu, Davao. So you have Korean communities living there and they're quite popular and you would, you would see them basically. And they're pretty much connected to say churches and the uh, the educational communities in the Korean community. Itself. Right. I understand yeah. a lot of Koreans will go to the Philippines to learn English. Right. And sometimes, like for tourists, they would go to Boracay or Cebu and as a, as a family or as honeymooners, right? Because it's cheaper. It's like the same thing as Hawaii, but you don't spend that much. So, yeah, a lot of people, Koreans really like going to the Philippines. So how does Korea play then in the average Filipino's imagination? I mean, uh, just recently at the time of this recording, um, it seems that Kim Jong-un has launched his first successful ICBM. Mm -hmm. Would that kind of stuff get a lot of playtime on Korean, uh, on, excuse me, on Filipino airwaves? Yes, no. I wouldn't say no. Is that because of the current administration, your Kim Jong-un-like president? Or is that just in general, that people are just are not so interested in, in that kind of uh, – you know, international security type issues. I mean, in general, right? So even before, even during the president, um, admin, president Aquino's administration, we didn't have a lot of airtime when, when, when they had the crossfire at the DMZ, right? In 2015. So I was about to start grad school then. And I don't think a lot of Filipinos knew about it until CNN and, you know, BBC started blasting about the news. So if it's not in the international news, it wouldn't reach the local news. And even if they reach the local news, they wouldn't have like, a, you know, they wouldn't sit 30 minutes talking about it like Anderson Cooper does with in CNN, you know. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Philippines has a major investment in the UNC. You're a ascending state. You you, you support um UNC Rear, mm -hmm. um, you have, uh, you know, several decades of American military presence here. You guys have made, played a major part in just about every war in the 20th century in Asia. So it, it is, it is surprising to hear that, you know, there isn't this, I guess, more broad appeal or, or at least, you know, somewhat of, of an interest in, in what's going on here politically. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I was actually surprised because, um, to be honest, the education of Filipinos when it comes to history or Korean history in general, Asian history in general, is m more of like focused on, say, Chinese dynasties or whatever, like, say, ancient history, like Asian ancient history. It would be focused on how many dynasties did China have, not really looking into, like, oh, Korea's three dynasties, Goguryeo, Shilla, and Baekje, right? They they really, we didn't really learn about that. Well, sure. I mean, we don't learn about that in America I mean, either. Yeah, but still, when when you think about it, we participated in the Korean War. We had we sent an, exped, exped, like an expeditionary force, yes, the, the PEF talk, yes. And I only knew about that when I worked at the embassy. Can you believe that? I was already, say, 21, and I already graduated from international studies. And I didn't know that we actually... We were we were ascending state because we did not just really focus on that. So you had been watching Korea on TV and listening to their music for over a decade before you finally came here. In in what ways has it been significantly different than what you see on TV? 
Today, definitely, I would say the music is more bubblegum pop. What What does bubblegum pop mean? High pitched, just talking about oppas and like wearing、so、skimpy like clothes, ultra and, feminine. Kind of to the way that it's very objectifying. I would say that's、uh, one of the difference.、Um, what else? I th- I think in most measurements, women, let's say specifically Korean women here, have never had it better, right? I mean, it's it's far from perfect, and and women certainly face a much lower glass ceiling than in most other OECD countries.、Um, but in terms of your professional、uh, prospects, in terms of Your、um, ability to kind of create some space between your, your your parents, your parental obligations, you know, even if you look at you know the average age that women are getting married, it's, it's never been higher, right? So, in many objective measurements, women are more liberated than they ever have been, and yet, what you're saying is that in media, they're objectified even more. Yes,、um, I think even when you watch Korean dramas, right,、um, when a woman gets、uh, married to a guy, she goes to the Kunjib, right, to the house of the parents, and you see her being bossed around by the mother-in-law and being asked to do the dishes. It's a very common theme in in Korean dramas, and to to connect it to the Philippines, that's actually what a lot of Filipinos think when you marry into a Korean family. So, one of my aunts, yes, my mom's youngest sister, she told me about. Um, she brought that up to me before. It's like, oh, when you get married to a, a Korean family, you're probably gonna be in bad, you know,、um, relationship with your mother-in-law, or you know, be be asked to wash the dishes or something. Yeah. So because that's the way it's portrayed in Korean dramas, like the women stays in the house, and、uh, the guy needs to make money, right? So it's a very common stereotype. Well, forgive my ignorance here, but would the female experience in the Philippines be much different than that? It's a little bit different because、um, even in the generation of my parents,、uh, my mom、um, already、uh, was also working like after she had kids. So、um, she worked for say twenty years after she, you know. Um, gave birth to me, so she's been working for a very long time too, and it's not. And that wasn't weird. That, that wasn't, wasn't out weird, of the ordinary. No, no, that wasn't weird at all. A lot of mothers would also be working moms, so it's a very common trend in the Philippines. You know, as I I've said before, Filipinos are very pragmatic. So whatever you need to do to get money or food on the table, need to do it. So if Mothers need to go out of the house. If women need to go out of the house, they need to do it so that they could feed their family. So, is this an effort by the Korean government to kind of portray these traditional Korean values,、um, or is this just simply what sells abroad? And so, the writers are, as you said, making a pragmatic decision to create a product that will sell. I think it's more of a forging what a, what Korean values look like, but I'm not exactly sure too. How to how much extent the government is actually involved when it comes to dramas, especially when they air it. But I but I but I can notice. I don't know if I actually know it, but I can notice that、um, Korean government doesn't like the Korean government doesn't like sexual stuff into the dramas. You know, like if it's provocative, I would say the. Say especially KBS because it's a state company. It's a state broadcasting company, right? They would not. Put that out. So, in terms of censorship, I would say provocative ones. The Korean government probably wouldn't allow it, like their media censorship bureau or something. I'm not very familiar. You know, I think you could also go the other way too, and that there are a lot of gender roles that men are pushed into. I think particularly in the the K-pop realm.、Um, I have long maintained that a, a K-pop boy group is not going to do nearly as well as a K-pop girl group will do. For Western audiences, because the way that they dress and the way that they look and that they present themselves might play well for gender norms here and what is considered to be attractive or masculine in Korea, maybe the Philippines, China, but that in the U.S. it's just so far removed from I think what most、uh, heterosexual women and men would find to be masculine and let's say you know attractive. Do you think? Do you also see a difference in how men are portrayed in K-pop or K-dramas? 
In K-pop, I think there's like two different kinds of male image, like projection, right? You see this uh, masculine, like macho guy with like muscly, like six pack abs. And Could you, you give have, an example? Say mm, 2 p.m. Mm, All right. Yeah, or J Park, something like that. And on, on the other side, you have like a metrosexual guy, like uh, I'm a cute guy. Like, uh, you know, are you familiar with the Hichol, Kim Hichol from Super Junior? I'm not. He's a, the definition of a flower, like a male flower or something like that. Kumminam. Uh, like a flower boy, yes, a kombinam. See, I, I, I think, I think that at least just looking at looking at some of these, and again, I, I'm, I'm not consuming this in large quantities, but you know, from what little I do see on TV and in advertisements, it goes beyond metrosexual, but more sexually ambiguous. I would, say, I would agree. Actually, I would agree, and I don't wanna sound bad, but <laughs> no, I'm, yes. not, I'm the one who said it, right? You know, you're not sounding bad, but. Um, it, it's, it, it's, it's really, you know, it's, it's quite, it's quite different than what you'd see on, um, you know, just, just walking the subway here. Right. Yeah. And, um, it kind of reflects something about Korean culture and contradictions on Korean culture. Right. So, you know how it's okay to be like metrosexual and be sexually ambiguous, but being gay in Korea, being openly gay is a little bit too far. But then sometimes when you look at the media, when you watch variety shows, guys would be too touchy. That is, you know, that's very sexually ambiguous. And you'd be like, then maybe being gay in Korea is not too bad. But then you have stuff about the military, right? The, the Korean, how Korean gays in the military are treated, you know? And then being an LGBT in Korea also as a Korean is kind of hard, it's kind of kind of it's it's hard <laughs> it's hard because they're not accepted they're not socially accepted right so you you have this kind of contradiction to that you can see from k-pop and then you're immersed in korean society so i don't know that's one of the things that i find in korea as i am here well i think you can also say that it's it's difficult as a as a non-korean woman trying to be you know trying to make a career for herself, um, you know, how has that how has that been for you? Um, you're you're just graduating uh, just this month, right? You're just turning in your thesis. Congratulations! Thank you. Um, how do you think your long term professional prospects are here? I'm still at a crossroads right now. I'm still not sure if I could find a like a very stable job in Korea, but I would want to. Do you want to? I mean, if it's if it's good, why not? I mean. I studied in Korea and I know something about Korean culture that, you know, they probably can use me for since I'm a foreigner. So, but I still don't know if I could find that job. Um, but what I want to do is to either go into the academe again, but I would want to have a field experience first. So either find a research job later on. Hopefully, take me. <laughs> yeah, but um, be in you know, the, the professional career. So either with hopefully an international organization or dream or you know a public institute, the government either in the Philippines. But I don't really. I'm not really looking forward to going back home soon. So try to stay overseas for a little while. Are there advantages to living in Korea that you just you wouldn't find back in the Philippines? Yes. The transportation here is amazing. I could not stress that any further. Manila is a hellhole compared to Korea, compared to Seoul, even to a remote city. The bus system here is amazing. I love it. In the Philippines, we don't have a bus system. That's what it is. It's ridiculous. I hate the transportation back home. So when I was in, I think... I got burned out in the Philippines when I was working at the embassy, not because of the job, but because of the transportation. I would go to work in the morning, wake up at 5.30 in the morning, leave the house by 6, 6.30, uh, arrive at work 8.30 in the morning, 8 if it's early. So that's an easy two-hour one-way commute. And then if it rains, it's even more. And then you have the same amount of time going back home. So it's about four or five hours of commuting every day, Monday to Friday. That sounds really awful. It is. 
And a lot of my friends actually have been joking with me like, Alex, don't come back. Just stay there because the traffic is just getting worse. So I don't know. That, that's why the last time I went home, I just stayed at home and ate food. That's it. <laughs> yeah, Filipino food is, is quite delicious, I got to say. Yes, right? So what do you like? Oh, right. What's it called? <laughs> oh, you told me what it's called. The noodle thing. Pancet. Pancet. Yes, right? It's good. Pan I really like pancet. <laughs> it's very mild, right? So it's not too strong. Yeah, I, just, I, I love just the handfuls. Grabbing them, the handfuls yeah. is so mm -hmm. great. I love it. What do you do? What do you do in Korea besides work, besides study? Alcohol is very cheap in Korea. So, if had, you, had you had soju or or kas before? I mean, I mean, in the Philippines, they I've they have had, soju there. Yes, we have soju there, and I remember getting drunk in soju. Like first time I got drunk in soju, I elbowed one of my friends while we were like, oh. like I went to. Is, is that common to drink there? No, not at that time. What I do think, you What do you drink? I mean, we drink beer. We have good beer. We we brew. We have a good company that brews beer. So we have San Miguel. So we have. San Miguel Light and Pale Pilsen. So that's a staple beer and also Red Horse. So we have a good beer tradition in the Philippines. That's all better than Kaz. Way better than Kaz. So I don't want to say anything bad about Kaz because I still like getting drunk all of it because it's very cheap. But we've had a couple of other KGSP scholars here on the show. How, how would you describe the graduate school experience here in Korea? I would say I made the most out of it. So, I mean, generally, I would say the, you know, the rankings is way better than back home. But I think this is one of the sentiment. I mean, it's probably a little bit negative, right? A lot of, some of the graduate students, especially those who came from the West or other places, right, with better educational institutions would say that um, they didn't think studying in Korea is as better as as good as it is back academically then. rigorous Academic, yes exactly academically rigorous so to put it simply it's easier <laughs> it's easy significantly easier that's what they would say and that's what i thought too so i tried to make things hard for me here not because i think that, not because like so i think i had stuff to do because i i know that there are really good professors there and I want to just grab them, you know? So that's what I did. I took a research before coming to GSIS, I actually research which professor professor um, is, uh, you know, focusing on what kind of field. So I knew who to get, like I knew which classes to get when I, when I got to grad school. So that, that kind of research helped me. Is there any reason why you chose Korea University? So I actually applied for three schools. I did not apply for Yonsei. Of all, of all the universities mm -hmm. in Korea, I think Yonsei has the highest, uh, right. you know, mm -hmm. international salience. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not saying much, but I think if people know a school in Seoul, they say, oh, Yonsei. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I was just joking about it. But um, I did not apply for Yonsei GSIS because um, I did not think they have a specialty in peace and security. So I was really looking for that. And that's also the reason why I didn't apply for SNU. So I was looking at Ihua and Sogang. So I got accepted to both schools and they're in Shincheon. And at that time, I was thinking, oh, what should I pick? Oh, they're both in Shincheon. I would drink every day if I, if I actually went there. But then I, got, I get to KU and they, they have a Makali tradition and a lot of the people are actually alcoholics too so it doesn't actually make a difference but i do yeah, it I doesn't did. matter where you are in korea you're going to be an alcoholic exactly yeah but i do like my experience in korea university because um one thing that i really liked about our program is that we have a thesis so i mean everybody needs to write that and i think that's a significant um experience in grad school you know it's hard it's annoying it's frustrating but if you need it for a say a higher degree or for say professional advancement you have it right but if you go to master's and don't have thesis a thesis program it's basically useless what was your thesis on oh my thesis is about the u.s military presence in korea so 
basically I studied how the U.S. bases here, especially Yongsan and the expansion of Camp Humphreys in Pyeongtaek, affects the urban dynamics of the neighborhood. One of the things that I found is that the, because of the expansion of Camp Humphreys, Korea and um, the United States are being entrapped even further um, with the alliance because you have money being poured into local land. So if you have, if if you construct um, buildings into into land, you're they have more commitment with one another, and it makes the U.S. even harder to pull out from Korea in the longer run. So even if say um, the U.S. would say, oh, we're not really going to stay here for, for long because of the expansion of Camp from Freeze. It's like they're pulling back, but not exactly pulling back. So that's one of the biggest findings in my thesis. I see. So it, it's much more than just boots on the ground, but you actually have significant financial and other assets right? Yeah, that are locked into all these different value chains, mm-hmm. not just in the continental United States, but really all over the world, right? You right. Know? And it's not just like the political vacuum, you know, when if, if the U.S. pulls back from, from Asia, right, from Korea, it's not just that. It's more of like economic assets and economic connections as well, because there are a lot of Korean companies involved and contractors involved in the expansion of Camp Farm Free. So it's basically U.S. giving incentives to Korean companies making work with them. So it's it's a whole a lot of like maybe economic at the same time and also social because these bases also shape local communities. For instance, why is ET1 there? It's because of the military base, because the bases actually make places in, in the communities nearby them. So that's why you have Itaewon, that's why you have the Ville, right? These entertainment places around the bases. So. Now, what do you think is going to happen to Noksa Pyeong, Itaewon, even Samgakji, once mm-hmm. the base is transferred? Whenever oh. whenever that, that happens, it's supposed to be 2019. Right, yeah. I would think it would still be flourishing because one of the things that I think is different from the area in Yongsan, right? The area in Yongsan to other bases is that the international community has become, how do you say, it's like entrenched and very stitched into the base in the in the in the community of Noksapyeong, Gyeongnida, and Hebangcheon, and you know Itaewon, right? So even if the U.S. military base really shrinks down into like just a thousand acres or something in Yongsan, it's not going to make a lot of difference anymore. But if it does in KC, you know, on another side, on the flip side, if it does in if if the 2ID goes all down to Pyeongtaek, the Ville in KC will not have mm-hmm. very much business anymore. So the case in Itaewon is, I mean, you, you can find a lot of restaurants. It's not just American restaurants there, right? So mm-hmm. that's one kind of um, visibility, like one, one, one evidence where you can see that the international community is fully stitched to the community, not just the American military presence oh and at the same time soldiers would still go up to Itaewon to hang out on the weekends or when they have free time mm-hmm. so i actually found a study that most of the soldiers in korea that are stationed in other in other areas frequently go to Itaewon for the rest and recreation r and r right because that's the capital city and that's where they're right. mostly accepted that's interesting so regardless of where they're at so long as they're on some sort of public transportation route they're going to find their way to Taiwan. Mhm. Yes. I mean, Taiwan is easy to find. Once you're in Seoul, you can get there like by bus, by taxi, by Right in subway. the middle basically. Exactly, right in the middle. So you said he peace and security you said and you were kind of looking for a, a strong program with 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 research that you could really build on. The Philippines is is kind of right at the center of maritime peace and security. Do you have any comments on the the ongoing battle? That really is kind of a battle in many ways, uh, in the South China Sea? I think it was a a little bit disappointment, you know, with the new administration. I personally thought that the arbitration case, the result, is a breakthrough, right? But unfortunately, I still don't see why the the current government, the current search administration is not pushing through or is not using that um, as a leverage against China. Even if there are, you know, obviously disadvantages from it, the Philippines could still get something from it, at least when it comes to diplomatic presence or visibility or like at least, yeah. So it's, uh, you see the Philippines having this 
kind of a David and Goliath battle, right? Like the China is like the Goliath and Philippines is the David. So I I had that kind that kind of vision, and I think like the academ like the the academia in the Philippines do have that kind of idea, you know, because for for the longest time Philippines has been pushing for a hedging strategy in the South China Sea because that's the best strategy that we could get so far to keep like the strong ones that you have on your team and also keep the, the people you like the people you don't really want so just actually control what you can control right i was a little bit disappointed still with the lack of foreign policy maneuver of our president he's not one for subtlety and nuance yes very much not into that and that's one of the things that um i think well, can, can should I be ask? improved I mean, yeah i <laughs> I would also very much like that from the U.S. president, but <laughs> how is how is Duterte received among younger Filipinos? That's actually very interesting because you would never think, you know, I'm here and you, you know what I think about Duterte, right? I mean, I don't. I do, but our audience does not. Right. Um, I don't like him. I don't think there's a positive reason why he became the president. You know, and I think I think for at some point it's also. All right, you know, because I think him being elected um, signifies something about the political will of Filipinos, right? I'm not just voting for someone who's from Manila, not like a kind of elitist, you know, but also signifies someone that I'm now voting for someone who looks at the mass, you know, the masses. But on the other hand, you still have people like me who don't like him and would rather think about the foreign policy, you know, to have also that kind of strong strategy, like a strong foreign policy strategy. Um, but then a lot of um, Filipinos, especially younger ones, even my friends, some of my friends support him greatly, even with the bad rhetoric, even with the bad words. I mean, and these are educated, yes, you know, worldly yes, but Filipinos. Also, and yes, but also um, a big part of these young Filipinos are always on Facebook. And in Facebook, in the Philippines, it's very widely used. So a lot of fake news goes around and very propaganda-ish. So um, these young people are also exposed to that kind of things. I'm not saying that everybody is, you know, exposed to that, to propaganda, like of the government or those who support Duterte. But I would say it's a big part of that when it comes to the support group of the Filipino president now. Okay, so we are going to move to our rapid fire round, everybody's favorite part of the <laughs> podcast. Is there a Korean product that you never saw in the Philippines that you think would do really, really super well? That is actually a hard one. I'm ready to say like there's none because Korea is so near the Philippines and there are a lot of Filipinos who come here. So if they want something, they could easily ask someone to like, hey, just get me this thing and Three hours later, it's in Manila. I mean, genuine Korean food is in Korea. That's very hard to find in the Philippines. It, there is Korean food, I imagine, though. I mean, like, genuine... I don't know. Um, that's a very hard question. That really got me thinking. Maybe next question. <laughs> next question, yeah. <laughs> so you, you've been following K-pop in various intensities now for several years. Um, where do you think it will be in the next five, ten years? Do you think that it's going to continue its push to kind of take advantage of uh, foreign markets, or do you think it's going to be kind of become internal uh, as other Korean products, like cosmetics and film, uh, become more popular, or was I say consumed in greater quantities abroad? I would say outward looking. I think Korea is trying to be more international, and and one of their efforts is to look into foreign markets emerging markets that uh and into how and how to expand k-pop and hallyu overall into those to which they did not touch yet if you could choose one part of seoul to put a jolly bee in where would it be that's awesome <laughs> that's so awesome in hongdae why because you have a lot of people there i know and a lot of filipinos go there so they'd i don't know they'd probably not go to Jollibee, but even if I live in Hengi, I would go to Hongdae just for that. So, I mean, I'd put it in a very foreigner-friendly place, though. I wouldn't put it somewhere in Wangshimni or, say, Donggak. No, I wouldn't. Do you think it would work here? 
Okay, I, mean, I mean, they like chicken. We have good chicken joy. So I, I, I got to say, though, like Korea's fast food, so their domestic fast food, like Loteria is just awful. Right. So right. is yeah. Jollibee actually like really good? Is it is it a yes. significant that's upgrade we, to that? Yes, that's why we actually have branches of Jollibee in the U.S. Yeah, right. I, yes. I, I've seen it. Like It's definitely in my hometown yeah. back, back in the U.S., but I, I, I had never had it. Yes. Um, you know how like – so in Jollibee, it's a faster than the Philippines, right? And um, we have this sign- signature – they have the signature chicken called Chicken Joy. The crispiness of, of the – of the breading of the chicken is just on point. And um, one thing that actually I didn't, I kind of missed in the Philippines when I first moved to Korea is that when I eat chicken, I I normally have uh, a gravy, like a salty gravy kind of thing. That's a thing of Filipinos. And Korea doesn't have it. So you only have like kanjang, like the soy sauce, right? So that's like the, the closest you can get. But you don't have something like Jollibee. So I think Jollibee's chicken joy and the gravy can have, um, has something to offer to Korean market. Well, you know, if this whole uh, grad school thing doesn't work out, I think you know what you should go into. If I have the money, I would definitely bring it. But I don't know, like Jollibee is a, is a very big company in the Philippines. So franchising it is going to be hard. And I think Sandara Park from 21 should be thinking about that. I mean, I would support her if she actually brings Jollibee into Korea. What is the most ridiculous K-drama plotline you've you've seen? There's a lot to choose from, I know. I know, yeah, but I actually steer away from a lot of things, you know. I mean, as much as, say, Goblin is good, you know the new one, Dokkebi? The one with Gongyu? No, as I said, I don't watch Come much. On, I know I know who Gong, Gong Yu is, but <laughs> Yes, that hot guy, right? Yeah. So he has a new drama and he's a I don't know, a goblin. <laughs> he's a goblin. <laughs> Reprising his role. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh I mean this fantasy thing in that he has a sword on his um chest and there's this girl that needs to like take it out and uh-huh. then he dies and something like that. And I think that's crazy. But it's good. I cried so I mean, I watched it, I finished it, and I cried. It's still good, but it's crazy. <laughs> the plot is crazy. I think Gong, Gong Yu helps a lot there. Definitely. Definitely. Now, on the flip side then, have you seen a K-drama that you felt most accurately represented what it's like to live here? Oh, okay. Um, I did not finish this drama, though, um, but I watched a couple of episodes. It's called Mi Seng. So it, I think it means no life, yeah, right, if I'm not mistaken. But it's a mm-hmm. drama about... Korean, how, like how how Korean employees are in a in a big chebo in a Korean company, so it's basically the life of of a Korean worker, and a lot of my friends um, at that time I was in in my language intensive school, so we, some of my friends watched it and they said they really got touched, and I think a lot of Koreans I've heard from some Koreans too that that drama is very real and it hit you know it hit them. Because it's very realistic. On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the most, 1 being the least, how much do you miss mangoes? 11. Very expensive. So ridiculous. Like a like a piece of mango. It's like 6,000 won to 11,000 won. And back home... It's about 5 to $10. Mm-hmm. And then in the Philippines, you buy a kilo. You know how much it is? It's like $3. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. So this this is what you get for for everybody whenever you go back home, right? Yes. Mangoes on mangoes on mangoes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there was one time. Um, this is a funny story, right? I went back home last February, and I was like, "Oh, I need to go to the grocery store and find dried mangoes so I could bring it to friends here." And I couldn't find dried mangoes. I went to three or four grocery stores in Vanilla, and I asked the sales lady. I was like, "Um." Do you know why there are not like um dried mangoes here? And the person was like, "Oh, I'm sorry, ma'am. Um the Koreans got all of them." So mm, the Koreans Korea, have been here. Yeah. Koreans really taking all of our mangoes. Is there a word in Filipino that there is not a Korean equivalent for, but you just you wish so much there was? Kilig. What is kilig? It's a feeling of being like 
when you like someone, you have this like buttery, like buttery butterfly feel like in your stomach. Yeah, it's kind of like that. It's like a giddy feeling, but it's not exactly like giddy, something like that. So I don't think Korea has that. I think so. Kind of like a, a nervous anticipation. It's not exactly anxiety. An, it's not not, not quite nervous. nervous huh? No, no. It's it's more of like a. It's like excited, but not nervous. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Are there any last comments, or is there anything else you'd like to say before we end the show? So in the Philippines, um, even though we studied about a little bit about Asian history, there wasn't really much about the Philippine contingency. Um, and the Philippine presence uh, with with the U.S. and Korean soldiers in the Korean War, and I don't think a lot of people, especially the young um, K-pop fans now, know about it. So they only know about DMZ and very very little political knowledge about awareness awareness about about Korean issues. You know, um, they only know mostly that these fans, like the the, the fans today, only know about. K-pop and the whitening products and the skin skin products, right? So, um, I think that's. I guess that's, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, you know, so much of South Korea in the international mm -hmm. world is just so dominated by the North and geopolitical issues. Um, I mean, I, I I still sometimes you know kind of embarrassingly, but from friends and family, oh, you're in South Korea, right? Your soul, so that's uh, that's uh, south, right? Yeah, <laughs> right. You know, so it, there, there's very there's very little awareness of of where this country is and what it's doing, and mm -hmm. most of the time, and especially recently in the last year or two, it's been just dominated by Pyongyang. Right. And so, it, you know, it's not necessarily a bad thing that Korea has has discovered something that can separate it from those kind of really serious, ominous uh, type of things. Yeah, I mean, I get your point, but um, coming from like a Filipino perspective, I don't think we are really, we care. I don't think we care much about political issues like North Korea at all. Because in the media, we really don't have airtime about North well, Korea. Young Korean South Koreans don't care about North Korea either. Well, I mean, when it comes to like, I, I guess this is like coming from a political background, like an ISIR background, right? Like I wanted my country to actually have, to know something, like for them to actually have an idea about issues like this, you know? I don't know. I wish Filipinos knew more about Korea, not just because of K-pop, but also historically, because I don't think a lot of Koreans know either that the Philippines contributed to the Korean War. And continues to contribute to Korea's armed forces. Yes. All right, Alexine, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. I had a great time. Thank you again, Alexine, for coming on the show. I had to go out and get a bag of dried mangoes after our interview, and yeah, they were expensive. I'd say it was worth it, though. As always, uh, please do rate said layers of soul on iTunes. Share it on Facebook. Whatever you can do to share, promote the show. This is the 10th episode, and we've got many more in the works. Thank you all, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.